लॉज ऑफ मोशन यू चैप्टर फर्स्ट टॉकिंग अबाउट द फर्स्ट आंसर इन द लॉज ऑफ मोशन यप इज द इफेक्ट ऑफ फोर्स स्ट्रेट अवे गेट बैक टू ब्रास टैक्स इफेक्ट ऑफ फोर्स फोर्स हेल्प्स इन डूइंग टू थिंग्स इट इधर चेंजेस द पोजिशन ऑफ रेस्ट और मोशन ऑफ द बॉडी या और इट चेंजेस द डायमेंशन ऑफ द बॉडी सो कीपिंग इट सिंपल फोर्स चेंजेस द लोकेशन द पोजिशन that is the state of the state of rest or motion and second what does it do it changes the dimensions that is the shape and the size of the body this is what force can do to us right all right the second part or the second point how does a force act on a rigid and a non rigid object rigid something which is tough when i apply force on a tough object usually the dimensions don't change only the position changes if a body is moving it comes to a stop or even a force can move a stationary object right so can i say a rigid object force only changes only changes the position not the dimension but if it is a non rigid object like a clay okay and if i apply a force on the clay dhush it changes the shape size of the clay and possibility that it may also displace the clay move the clay in the forward direction so non rigid for a non rigid object force changes both that is the position as well as as well as the dimensions and that's my second answer for you the third is how many types of forces are there usually there are two kinds of forces a contact force and a non contact force so my third answer is the depth about contact force now what are contact forces okay the forces okay in which which are in physical contact with each other okay the force in which the body is in physical contact or bodies are in physical contact with each other and produce a force are called contact forces we have we have five types of contact forces the first one we can start with a frictional force the second force is a normal reaction force the third force which we can talk about is the, uh, the tension force the fourth force we going to speak about is come on tell me tension after tension force the compression force the restoring force and the fifth force is because of the collisions of the bodies okay collisions the spelling collisions here yeah. collisions of the body yeah that's okay now tell me one thing if i'm talking about a frictional force right it's a contact force in which the two bodies who two bodies come on if i'm walking on the road if i'm walking on the road let's make a a, a diagram a foot and on the road okay this is my foot my toe when i walk ahead my displacement is in this direction how do i walk when i walk i push the ground backwards and i walk ahead right so displacement is in the forward direction but the frictional force acts in the backward direction always remember the frictional force and the displacement are always opposite to each other so can i say frictional force is obviously a contact force because there is a touch normal reaction force when there is an object on the table all right the weight of the object weight acts vertically downwards but but the book or the body the object does not fall it is supported by the table 
because the table exerts a force which is equal in magnitude yes the value is equal to that of the book but opposite in direction and it is perpendicular to the surface it is 90 degree normal to the surface so can i say how did the name come book exerts a rea an, an action force the surface of the table exerts an, a reaction force so obviously it's a reaction force why normal because it's 90 degree perpendicular to the surface right tension force is a force which is usually associated with the string all right so if there is a if there's a rigid support a string and let's say a ball tied to a string again the weight of the ball the weight of the object the body because of the pull of the gravity acts vertically downwards the tension in the string acts vertically upwards so similar to this one equal in magnitude opposite in direction right and that's how that's how the support remains intact fine so this is the tension force then we have a restoring force this force is usually attached the word is attached to a spring okay so if i take a rigid object and i attach it to a spring and i pull the spring can i say when i pull the spring the potential energy increases because the distance the height increases all right so as the as the spring is pulled it will become something like this after which i can't pull else it will break down the spring will break now when i i, I leave the spring it goes back to its compressed state it goes back to its initial position it restores itself it restores the potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy right with this and can i say this is called a restoring force where it is in the deformed state it restores its energy comes back to its initial position that's the restoring force and the last force due to the collisions all right collisions i'm saying the spelling of double l it's it's thoda incorrect but you just take care about it fine okay collisions okay when two bodies are gonna collide it's a wheel and some some circular or oval object when they start moving together eventually obviously they bang each other they collide so if i say this is body a and body b we call it as force ab and force ba that is force exerted okay force exerted by one body on another body so that is simple just collision forces so these are the five types of contact forces the definitions have to be done by heart from the book itself then we have some uh, examples in each of the following you can definitely refer it to from the book i have taken a few of them and explained the parts the fourth type we call it as a non contact force all right a non contact forces are forces okay which they you know what like there is some sort of an attraction between these two bodies some sort of a repulsion between the two bodies but they are not in physical contact with each other so the forces which are not in touch the contact with each other are called non contact forces there are three examples which i can give you the first one gravitational force second is a magnetic force and the third non contact force is electrostatic force so i can think of three non contact forces gravitational force depends upon the mass it is a force which depends upon the masses of the two bodies magnetic force depends upon the poles that is the polarity of the two bodies and the electrostatic force depends upon the charges of the two bodies always remember and out here i can say i can claim the gravitational force is always attractive in nature so this force is always attractive it will never repel if you throw an object up 
it will go up and still it will come down. If you just leave an object due to the free fall, it will come down. If you throw an object in a horizontal manner, it will move in a projectile motion and it will come down. Something like this. That means, can I claim that every time the object is attracted towards the mother earth. So it is always attractive, not repulsive. Magnetic force. The two light poles, they will repel. But, but the two unlight poles, uh, this is also going to be, if this is south, one is north, other has to be south. All right, so if I make a clear diagram, north, and if this is south, obviously this is going to be attractive, and obviously this is going to be repulsive. So I can claim that the magnetic forces can be attractive also, and they can be repulsive also. Also out here, this again can be attractive or repulsive. Because electrostatic force, it's because of the charges. Light charges, same charges, plus, plus, will repel. But unlike charges, plus, minus, will attract. So I can say that for non-contact forces, we have three of them, in which the gravitational force is the only attractive force. The remaining two can be attractive as well as repulsive, depending on the condition. Okay? And finally, if I talk about to end the A part, this is just the A part of the chapter, students. And I can say the characteristics of non-contact forces. Now, what are the characteristics of non-contact forces? The first one, gravitational force is always attractive and magnetic force and electrostatic force can be attractive as well as repulsive. That is the first characteristic. These are characteristics of non-contact forces. Students, please. And if I'm talking about the second, okay. The second um, characteristic is these force, okay, these forces or the force between the two bodies. Let's say these are the two bodies, body A and body B. Okay. And the distance between the centers of the two bodies, let's say it is R, just a symbol R. It's a distance of separation between the two bodies. The force of attraction between the two bodies, it is, it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of separation between the two bodies. We call this as inverse square law. I am repeating, understand, the force of attraction between the two bodies is inversely proportional, inverse means it comes down, inversely proportional to the square, square of the distance of separation, the distance of separation between the two bodies. That means if you separate these two bodies, if you make them far away, a boy and a girl, they are, they are boyfriend, girlfriend, they are, they are couples. As they go far, distance increases, force of attraction, the bonding decreases. So I can say guys, that if the distance decreases, the force of attraction, the power of attraction increases, right? So this was my first part, okay? A quick review about the A part of laws of motion. Go through it and we'll attack the B one. Talking about the B part, which is Newton's first law of motion, right? So we are now on the B part. Okay, the first answer is uh, Galileo was the one who had started with this process. He said that if a body, once you give or apply a force to the body, the body will keep on moving infinitely. You don't need a force continuously to keep a body in motion. It is because of the frictional forces, the air resistance, the viscosity, the, you know, the friction of the ground. Because of all these things, the body comes to a stop. However, Galileo stated that if a body is at rest, it will, it will remain in a state of rest. And if a body is in motion, it will continue in a state of motion. Unless there is some force, like a frictional force, 
which comes and stops it. And this was in a very proper manner, in a very devised form given by Newton as Newton's first law. So Newton's first law states, okay, the direct definition can be by hearted from the textbook, but it states that when a body, when a body is at rest, when a body is at rest, it will continue to remain in a state of rest unless, unless an external force comes and moves it. Unless an external force is applied, which comes and moves the position of rest of the body. However, if a body is already in motion, if a body is in motion, we also need an external force which comes and stops the moving body. So if I happen to say a proper definition, I would say this way. If a body is at rest, it will continue to remain in a state of rest unless and until an external force comes and moves it. And if a body is in motion, it will continue to remain in a state of motion in the same direction. If it's in this direction, it will continue to remain in the same direction unless an external force comes and stops the body. Right? So this was your Newton's first law. He, it was based on the qualitative analysis. Now what's that? Okay, qualitative analysis tells me the quality. Quality means it just tells me that yes, to move this, I want force. How much force? I don't know. It doesn't tell me about the quantity, the magnitude. It tells me only about that bloody you need a force here. Yeah, that's it. Only a force. How much? Don't know. You need it. You need to find it out. So it just gives me a qualitative analysis, an upper view, a superficial analysis. Right. Uh, there are two types of qualitative analysis. One is definition of force and definition of inertia. Okay, now let's study about the definition of force as my third answer. Force. Definition. It is said, force is that external cause, force is that external cause which moves a stationary body or it stops a body in motion. Are you understanding? It's very simple, yeah? You just understand. It moves or sets in motion. Whom? A stationary object, an object at rest, or it stops a body who is already in motion. So that's force. The fourth point is about inertia. Inertia is nothing but mass, simple layman's term. More the mass of the body, more the inertia. So if there is a thin body, ah, come on, come on. If there is a thin body and if there is a fat body, can I say a thin body will have less inertia, a fat body will have more inertia. So who is difficult to move? Obviously a fat body because its mass is more. So what is inertia? Inertia is a characteristic. It is inherent property of a body. What do you mean by inherent? Every bloody body on this earth has some mass, some inertia. Yes, obviously even the air around us has inertia. Have you ever tried taking a badminton racket and just pushing out the racket in the air? You know, just, just swapping it off in the air. You will hear air molecule sound wipe off. That's inertia. So with inertia, yes, it is the inherent, it is the nature of every body to have mass, to have inertia, right? So this was Newton's first law and the analysis, the qualitative analysis. Talking about Newton's first law, division into two sections. We had inertia of rest. And second, Newton gave inertia of motion. Inertia of rest. If a body is at rest, it will continue to remain in a state of rest unless and until 
an external force comes and moves the body. Example, if I am standing in a train or, or a vehicle, okay, my body is at rest. My lower body, lower body means legs, they are in direct contact, direct contact with the bus, right, or with the vehicle. Now, can I say, we all three are at rest. Who three? The bus, me, and my lower body. We all are at rest right now. Suddenly, okay, the bus driver starts the bus. So can I say the bus is in motion? Okay, when the bus is in motion, my lower body is in direct contact with the bus. That will also be in motion. But my upper body is relaxing. Oh, come on, man, I'm enjoying. So upper body is at rest. So can I say lower body goes ahead, the upper body remains at the same place. So it will be something like this. Oh, so can I say I experience a jerk in the backward direction. Actually, I'm not going back. The bus is going ahead. My lower body is going ahead. My upper body is still there. So that's one of the examples. There are many examples given in the book. If I happen to take one more example of inertia of rest. A, a carpet is there, right? A carpet is there. I bang the carpet on the wall. When the carpet hits the wall, the carpet is pushed inside. It's cushion, yeah, cushion. The carpet is pushed inside, right? All right, and when you withdraw the carpet, all the dust material, the dust particles of the carpet, they are still there, they are at rest. And the carpet is withdrawn. So can I say the dust particles fall down? So the dust has not moved ahead. The carpet moved ahead, banged itself, got squeezed in, came back, dust particles were still bloody there. Another example, I take a glass, it's a very common example, a commoner. And I take a cardboard and there is a coin. What I do is, coin is at rest. I zoop, I, I, I take away, I snatch the cardboard at a speed. What happens? The coin falls down. The coin is at rest, it will remain in a state of rest, right? So, so many examples of inertia of rest. Talking about inertia of motion. When a body is in motion, it will continue to remain in a state of motion in the same direction unless and until an external force comes and stops the body. Same example. Now, 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 listen, listen, listen. I was in motion. I'm, I'm, I'm holding the handle of the bus. The bus is moving. I am moving. We both are moving, right? We are in motion. The lower body, my legs are in contact with the bus. Suddenly, the bus driver applies a brake. Shit, man. He applies a brake. There are some, some cows on the road. When he applies a brake, I move ahead. Now, what happens is my lower body and the bus both came to a stop. My upper body was freely moving ahead, enjoying air. So my upper body was still in motion. So when the bus and the lower body comes to a stop, upper body goes ahead, right? So if a body is at, if a body is in motion, it will remain in a state of motion. If I'm pedaling a cycle, a bicycle, I stop pedaling, I stop pedaling. Will the bicycle come to a stop instantly? Nope. Of course not. Won't the bicycle move on for some longer distance and then it will come to a stop. Actually, if there would not have been any friction between the tires and the ground, if there would not have been a friction, then there would have not been any stoppage. I would have gone ahead and ahead and ahead. But because of the frictional force between the ground and the tires, after a while, the bicycle comes to a stop. But come on, yeah, isn't the body still in motion? Okay, in spite of not applying a force continuously. That is nothing but the B part. So the B part is basically very simple. It's like a crash course. I'm going a bit fast. I know that, right? A B part, basically, what does it tell me? It tells me that Newton's first law of motion is about rest and motion. Yep, body at rest, remain at rest, body in motion, continue in motion in the same direction. Till forces are applied, 
and they you know waver the motions of the body and we spoke about inertia and force a small part okay and that winds up my b part let's go with the next part the c part it tells me about newton's second law of motion so the first a part was about the general forces and all b part was dedicated to the first law c to the second law what does second law state it starts this way momentum is the product of mass and velocity momentum is the product of mass and velocity mass is measured in kg velocity is measured in meters per second so the si unit of momentum is going to be kg meter per second and the cgs unit wouldn't it be gram centimeter per second all right now if i'm talking about a change in momentum okay a change in momentum i'm going to talk about delta delta multiply both sides by delta in physics delta represents a small change or a change a change in momentum is either because of a change in mass and velocity i start this way change in momentum is because of change in mass and velocity but remember on this earth on this earth mass is a constant mass remains a constant because the velocity of a body velocity of any object moving on this earth is extremely small as compared to the velocity of light this i have proved in my extended lecture of 9th standard right now just accept in a crash course what is required just mention or remember that any body on this earth moves very slow as compared to the velocity of light the speed of light is humongous that's that's the speed of light right so because of this condition mass on this earth is a constant so if mass is a constant mass can come outside yep so can i say delta p is equals to m delta v that means change in velocity i'm sorry change in momentum is not because of the change in mass it is bloody only because of the change in velocity so change in momentum is only because of a change in velocity okay as i said <clears throat> this is said to be a change in velocity change in velocity means can i say final velocity minus initial velocity so change in momentum is nothing but m into final velocity minus initial velocity dividing both the sides by time you get m v minus u upon t both the sides i have divided by time don't cancel it like a fool <laughs> then what's the use of doing that right and v minus u upon t i think you have heard about it it's acceleration this is stated or represented as force mass into and this is said to be acceleration come on isn't it rate of change of velocity acceleration ah yeah, you've done this in second chapter acceleration is v minus u final velocity minus initial velocity upon time and there you get the formula force is ma so hence forth i'm going to remember force as ma mass into acceleration guys yeah lovely and from here we come to newton's second law it is this guys that's newton's second law what the hell does it state check na force is proportional to delta p upon t or delta t look at the way i speak the force is directly proportional to the rate this time is said to be rate in english to the rate of change in momentum i'm repeating the force is directly proportional to the rate of change of momentum 
and the momentum takes place in the direction of the applied force that means if i'm applying force in this direction i'm hitting the shot in this direction okay the momentum is in this direction right so example i'm i'm, I'm playing cricket i hit the ball in this direction so can i say force is in this direction the momentum the ball will also travel in that direction so the direction in which i apply force the momentum rests in the same direction right with this so again force is directly proportional to the rate of change of momentum and the momentum takes place in the direction of the applied force that's newton's second law for you all all right a lot of more things in newton's second law first we can study about the three graphs i call it as fma graphs the first graph let's speak about that and the third graph i'll draw at the bottom right it's okay yeah, fine perfect so can i say the first graph okay the first graph we know force is mass into acceleration what you do is keep mass as a constant if mass is kept constant can i say force and acceleration are directly proportional to each other so if you apply more force body will accelerate more right with this more the force more is the acceleration direct proportionality so i can say in the first case first case take one of them as a constant let's keep mass is a constant and if mass is a constant force and acceleration are directly proportional to each other that means more the force you apply more is the acceleration so can i say if acceleration is out here the force will be out here to produce a larger acceleration to produce a larger acceleration more force needs to be given to the body so it's a direct proportionality where i can say mass is a constant in the second case in the second case um force you take you take acceleration as a constant force and mass are directly proportional that means when you apply more force to a body okay a more force applied on a body can actually move a heavier body that means more the mass of the body heavier the body more is the force needed so force and mass are directly proportional if acceleration is kept a constant and finally if you talk about acceleration and mass keeping force as a constant one of them will go down so can i say one upon mass is nothing but acceleration that means acceleration is inversely proportional to mass okay acceleration is inversely proportional to mass so i can say more the mass of a body less will the body accelerate come on a fat body a fat body okay a heavy body has a less acceleration right a truck moving and a car moving who will have more acceleration of course a car it will accelerate faster because it's lighter than the truck so i can say as the mass increases as the mass increases acceleration decreases so this is an inverse proportionality graph force is kept a constant so what you do is in all the three graphs you keep one parameter out of three these three keep one of them constant so if one change one is kept a constant the challenge is between both so if one changes the other also changes two direct proportionalities and one inverse proportionality so go through this and yet we have to speak a bit more about the c part newton's second law going on with a few give reasons for newton's second law of motion whenever a fielder is catching a ball he withdraws his hands that means when the ball gets an impact on the hands he takes his hand a bit behind the reason is newton's second law of motion the the formula we studied is force force is proportional yep yeah, to rate of change of momentum that means i can claim i can say 
that force of impact is inversely proportional to time. What the fielder is trying to do is, he's trying to withdraw the hand. He's trying to increase the time interval between the catch, the actual impact of the ball, yeah, and when it comes, when it just touches the hand. So if the time interval increases, time interval increases, can I say the force of impact on my hand decreases? So what a, basically a player tries to do is, he tries to increase the time interval. As a result of which, he gets a less force, a less effect of force on his hand. So he's not hurt much. Remember that. Again, another give reason is about a glass. A glass, when it falls on a carpet, it does not break. It does not break. Because the carpet, when the glass touches the carpet, the carpet goes a bit down. It is compressed. So the time interval between the actual glass touching the base, right? And when it has an impact on the carpet, is different, yeah? The time interval increases. As a result of which, because of more time interval, the impact of force is less. When a, when a, when a, 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 a fielder, an athlete, not a fielder, an athlete, runs for a long jump or a high jump, he lands on the sand usually. Okay, for a high jump, the landing is done on the sand because when the foot, when the foot touches the sand, it then gets depressed. It goes a bit inside the sand and then comes to rest. So the impact on the heel, the foot is a bit less. The force on the feet of foot is less. So in all the three give reasons or cases, the theme remains the same. We are trying to use Newton's second law of motion in which we are trying to increase the time period. So the force of impact, the hurt is less. All right, going on with Newton's third law of motion and that is nothing but the D part of the chapter. Third law is very simple. Every action, every action has equal and opposite reaction. So every action has equal and opposite reaction. And always remember that action and reaction forces do not act on the same bodies. They don't act on the same bodies. If this is a wall and this is my hand and I'm trying to push the wall, the action is done by my hand on the wall. The wall exerts a reaction force on my hand. So can I say action is me on the wall, reaction is wall on me. So can I say the action and reaction forces, they are not on the same bodies, they are on different bodies. Remember that man. Right. And the third thing, action and reaction forces, as I said, they are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. Okay, if action force is represented by F12, then the reaction force will be represented by F21, the method of writing. Also, there are so many give reasons I can talk about in this. If I'm walking, I am walking right now. When I walk, I press my foot on the ground and I push the ground back and I displace forward. Can I say action is of my foot, of my foot on the ground. Reaction is the ground on my feet or my foot. Whenever I'm sailing a boat, right, with the help of an oar, I push the boat behind. Isn't that my action force? The boat moves ahead. So can I say action and reaction forces are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. Whenever you're talking about a rocket, okay, you, you ignite the gases of a rocket. When they get ignited, they, when, when you open the nozzle, we call it as a nozzle, the gases flow down, all right, they push themselves down on the ceramic or some tiles which are specially made up of, and the rocket is pushed up. So the gases exert an action force on the ground, and the, and, and the ground exerts a reaction force on the rocket. When I, I'm shooting it, when I'm shooting with the help of a rifle, can I say when I shot, tush, I have a recoil velocity. I go back a bit because the action is 
by the gun on the bullet and the reaction is by the bullet on the gun the recoil what we call it as the spring action right so these are examples of action and reaction forces they come for give reasons however in this part we don't have much involved it's just that simple and sweet all right that that actually ends my third law nothing much to speak about it and the last part of my chapter the e part talking uh, certain things about gravitational gravitation always remember that if i'm talking about two heavenly bodies m1 and m2 heavenly bodies means planets asteroids meteors stars etc right and the distance of separation between them is represented by r then the force of attraction between the heavenly bodies is directly proportional to the product of the masses of the two bodies the force of attraction between the two bodies is proportional to the product of the masses of the two bodies and the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of separation between the two bodies if you club them up you can say that force is proportional to m1 m2 upon r square when a proportionality is converted into an equality we put a gravitational constant that's g in this case that's g m1 n2 upon r square so always remember students always remember that this g this g is known as a universal gravitational constant and we have a fixed value g has a fixed value the value of g is 6.67 into 10 raised to minus 11 if i talk about the units of g i don't know i'm sorry let's prove it let's prove it isolate g separate it out dude cross multiply you get fr square is g m1 m2 m1 m2 goes down so can i say g is equals to come on force force is measured in newton radius yeah, radius means distance distance r is the distance distance is measured in meter so this is gonna be meter square upon kg kg mass is measured in bloody kg so it's gonna be kg square that means the si unit is guys newton meter square per kg square that's kg raised to minus two so all of y'all, this is universal gravitational constant in the entire universe. Forget about Earth. This value remains the same. All right, fine. Always remember this what I've written. This, this force of attraction between the two heavenly bodies. Yep. It depends upon the masses. Of course, yeah. Of course. Depends upon the masses. Remember, that's very important because it's dependent on kg square here, m1, m2. And it also depends upon the distance of separation between the two bodies. Fine. After this, if I talk about one heavenly body, let's say Earth, and one is me. Okay, a small body on the Earth. Remember, I go upstairs, I go upstairs on the terrace and I just lose myself. I just have a free fall. Don't worry, I'm not going to die, please. Okay, there is, there is some cushion at the bottom. My friend has kept. All right, so if I just have a free fall, remember, Earth attracts me. Hey, tyrant, come here. I'm, I'm waiting for you, the Mother Earth says. I say, Mom, I'm also waiting for you. So actually, listen, Earth attracts me. I also attract the Earth. We both attract each other, mother and a son relationship. We love each other. So remember, I, okay, I when fall down, y'all can see me very distinctly. Hey, tyrant fell. He's been attracted by the mother earth. But the mother earth also comes slightly towards me. Very mi minute, very infinite simul. Now that tells me that we both move towards each other. I move towards earth, earth also moves towards me, but the movement, the motion of earth is so small, 
that we can't see, we neglect it. But remember, there is an attraction bidirectional. So if I talk about the force of attraction between me and earth, yep, it is going to be given by one of the formula is force is mass into acceleration due to gravity. And the second, okay, and the second one is this one. F is equal to G. You can start with M1 into M2. Now, M1 is the mass of the earth, a heavenly body. You can call it as capital M also. And this small m is mass of my body. It's me. This is a small, it's me. It's my mass, attraction towards the earth. All right. If you compare the two equations, remember, uh, LHSs are the same. RHS will also be the same. Mg is equal to GMM, obviously, upon R square. Upon R square. Can I say in this, in this respect, M gets cancelled. That means I get G is equal to GM upon R square. That means acceleration due to gravity, acceleration due to gravity depends upon the mass of the heavenly body. And it also depends upon the R. R you can say the radius of the earth. Or radius of the heavenly body. So the acceleration due to gravity. We Don't we say that on this earth, the acceleration due to gravity is approximately 9.8 meters per second square. Now where the hell did this value come from? It came from this. We know G is equal to 6.67 into 10 days to minus 11. M is the mass of the earth. It's huge, Six, around 6.24 into 10 raised to 24 or 27 kgs, I don't know. And radius of the earth. When you substitute all these values, you get the answer of G. On the moon, on the moon, the value of G is approximately one sixth of that of the earth. So if, if, okay, the weight of my body on the earth is 60 newtons or 60 kgf, on the moon, it is going to be one sixth. It will be 10 kgf. So remember, it all the, the value of g differs. The small g, the small g, differs from planet to planet, place to place. Yeah, from uh, one asteroid to another asteroid or something like that. But but capital G remains the same, right? So there is a difference between acceleration due to gravity and this g. All right, just go through this and just a small part or a portion left for our crash course from the last part, E part. Yeah. Differentiate between mass and weight. So if I'm talking about mass, all right, mass, okay, it's a measure of quantity of the body, yeah, and weight, weight depends upon the acceleration due to gravity. However, I can start with simple points. Mass remains the same throughout. So it remains the same from one place to another at, at, at any place, at every place. <laughs> that means on the earth, on the moon, you go anywhere, mass remains the same. Weight changes with place. You have different weight on the moon, different weight on the earth, different weight on some other planet. Second. Mass is a scalar quantity. Weight is a vector quantity. We've studied what's a scalar and what's a vector in the second chapter. Mass is measured, the SI unit of mass is kg. But the SI unit of weight, SI unit of weight is Newton. Uh, again, mass remains the same, scalar, SI unit, fine. I think that's more than enough, mass and weight. That's it. Three points of differentiation might suffice. And the last part, we can talk about one kilogram force and one gram force. The definition. One kilogram force is the force acting on the body of one kg, okay, of one kg by the earth or by a particular planet. I'm repeating. It is the force acting on a body 
of mass 1 kg is called 1 kilogram force and the force acting on the body of mass 1 gram is called 1 gram force. It's a very simple definition and always remember if you want to convert a kilogram force to a Newton you multiply with gravity always remember that. So if G the value of G is 9.8 you multiply with 9.8 to get converted into a Newton, right? So this guys was about part of the chapter laws of motion, huge chapter, a huge chapter. But if you want the entire length, you can definitely refer to my ninth standard at length, the abridged version of the Newton's law of motion. It is purely from the textbook, purely from the curriculum, the syllabus. I have not been deviated much, I have not diverted much from my topics, I have stuck to the textbook and the curriculum and the syllabus of 9th standard.